Okay, greetings everybody. We're back for 5114 Statistical Inference. And we left off less, last time talking about the name and Pearson Lemma. I'm going to remind you about a couple things about this, but ultimately we're going to prove this stuff over here. So let me just restate everything real quickly. The name and Pearson Lemma in the simple versus simple case, and I'll say this, this case all the results that we know about this case extend to the one-sided test. Um, for the two-sided test, the culprit that I'm usually picking on, that we all disagree on, everything we say right here can be extended with additional constraints into the problem. As you know, constraints usually change the very nature of the problem. Um, so this, the results I'm saying can be extended in some sense to the two-sided case but not um, without building in a, a bias, an unbiased condition here. We'll talk about that stuff next week, and we'll compare the two-sided test, the sharp test, in a Bayesian and uh, Neyman Pearsonian framework. We'll talk about the peculiarities there and where I think people are disagreeing. Um, in the simple versus simple case, I don't think this is all that controversial. In the one-sided case, I think it's all right, too. And I'll tell you certain things that I like about it in the one-sided case. As you've seen previously, the Bayesian and the non-Bayesian, in one one-sided case, agreed completely, but they had very different interpretations to the measure they constructed. So the p-value and the posterior probability. Okay, so lots of comparison to do. But simple versus simple hypothesis. So these are just two data points that we're comparing to each other. And the name of Pearson test is this one. So X is in the rejection region. So the data that you see, the summary statistic, the minimal sufficient statistic, whatever it is, or the high dimensional data lives in some rejection region. And that's going to be defined by this condition right here. And we have the um, complement condition as well. I'll point out that this condition is really the likelihood ratio test stat. So I'll just write that down. So this is really the likelihood ratio test in disguise. If you're confused about that, go back to the last lecture and there's a conversation about that. But this condition really is likelihood ratio testing. Um, and I just want to write down what that looks like again. So when I normalize it a little bit differently, I might write down my max theta element of h naught likelihood function divided by the max theta element of the alternative space likelihood function. And I bound this by some number that lives between 0 and 1. And I kind of argued last time that this passes a lot of my sniff tests, that I'm using a likelihood ratio and I'm doing something with it, and I like doing that. Uh, we have lots of reasons for doing that. Oh, this is a little bit off. This is union with H naught. This version down here has the other normalization where I'm only dividing by the alternative space. What that does is it changes the interpretation of our threshold from a number living between 0 and 1 to some positive number right here. So k is going to be some positive number in this um, set of conditions. But I argue that for the simple versus simple case, this is exactly the same criterion. We just have a different threshold sitting there. And I, I've said that I like likelihood ratios. The contention here in everything that if this is a monotone rule, so if it's increasing in theta or something like this, using this one-sided thresholding makes sense. If you find the breaking point, everything past that is um, either worse or better, depending on where you're coming from. And so if this is continuing to get smaller and smaller and smaller as a function of theta, it's telling you that those thetas in the null region are very unlikely. And so if you cross the threshold, you're just going to be more assured as you keep going past it. 
If this rule right here isn't monotone, it's that sign, the one-sided thresholding, that doesn't quite make sense. And so I'm not sure I would consider this a reasonable rule in something like the two-sided case. So just a little bit of in intuition there. Um, so we need to do something and treat this in the two-sided case so that this is even a reasonable rule. Okay, so this is the likelihood ratio of test stat in disguise. And then when I gave you some notation. I ended up saying, let this delta function right here pertain to this rule. And so this really is the Neyman Pearson test right here. So it indicates that we reject when it's a one, and it says we're going to fail to reject when it's a zero. I said, except over here, you can deal with that language the way you'd like. OK, here's the claim for Neyman Pearson. So when I follow this rule right here, and I pick K such that the probability of being in the rejection region is equal to alpha, so I can find that number right here that ends up um, defining the rejection region such that the probability of being in there is alpha. And so that's just fudging around with K to get you there. So this condition is going to be true throughout our whole proof. So this is the interesting part, is what the rule is. But the Maiden Pearson lemma says that if you follow rules one and two, so it's size alpha, um, if you follow this rule right here and lock your max type one error to be alpha, then your test is going to be uniformly most powerful. And so what I mean by that is in the alternative space, the power function is going to be higher. So it has more power. What does that mean? 1 minus the power in the alternative space is the type 2 error rate. So it's minimizing that. So I'll say that. Min type 2 error. OK. Here's the other side of the, the name and Pearson lemma. It says that if there's a test that satisfies this right here. If there's a test satisfying this, then any test that's UMP is this test right here. So that's really your if and only if statements. So it's saying that this is a UMP test. And if there's another UMP test out there, it's really this in disguise. And so that's the idea. And we're going to prove that. So we set up everything, or we just wrote down our name in Pearson test, and then we consider some other test. And it has some other rules, we might say. What we will say is that both tests are size alpha. Um, in the book, there's a caveat that it says maybe you can consider this to be a level alpha test. And I'll discuss that briefly, but I'm just going to say they're both size alphas. So there's one other little tiny thing. Um, nothing goes wrong if you make this test less than size alpha. And so if you reduce the type 1 error on this test, this is still going to beat it in the alternative space, is what it says. I'll make mention of that. But with these two tests, we argued this inequality right here. And I said this is the master equation. Or I should say inequality for this proof. Proof being that this test is the uniformly most powerful one, and any other test that can match it in the alternative space happens to be this test in disguise. They're equivalent tests. Um, I just made this up, the name master inequality, just to emphasize importance. Nobody else calls it this. Um, how we check this is we just verified this inequality in all the various cases. When this was a 1, this was a 1 or a 0. When this was a 0, and this was a 1 or a 0. So you had four things to check. And you can verify that this is always positive. 
and it has to do with this condition over here. Okay, so if this is always positive, the integral is always positive. And the integral reduces to these four power functions. So let me just write that down, show you what's going on here. We'll remember that everything's size alpha and which tests we're doing. So note. This integral, once I expand this, there's four terms in all of this. This multiplying across that in that, and this one multiplying across here and here. So I have delta functions being multiplied into their density functions, and then I'm integrating over x. So each one of these integrals, I'll just write this one down for instance, write down zero, just as an example. This integral right here is the expectation of the delta function. Where am I sampling under if you'd like? It's this thing. That's that expectation. Right here. Expectations of indicators are probabilities of that event, the indicator itself. So this is just the probability that delta x is equal to a 1 or a 0, given theta naught. So this right here, when it's a 1, x is in the rejection region. So it's the probability of that event. So this is a reject. So this right here is the probability of rejecting. Under this rule, that's what this whole thing is. This is denoted b e theta zero, the power function on theta zero. So this is the power given theta zero. So this is the probability that I will reject theta naught. That's my null hypothesis, given that theta naught is true. That's that probability. So this is an error rate. That's an error. That's a mistake. So we want this thing maybe to be low, but we fixed it. We fixed it to be alpha in the first place. So I'll point out this thing is alpha. That's the power, given theta naught, and we've capped that. So if you go through the arithmetic, you get these four different power functions. And they're evaluated under the different hypotheses. So this is the power. Under NP test. So it's the probability of rejecting when the alternative is true. So we want to reject. We want that to be big. And we're going to see in a second that this probability is bigger than that one. And that's going to conclude our proof. So this is the power of this thing, whatever test this is. And so it's some other test. And ultimately, we want to show this is bigger than that, and that will conclude our proof. What we can notice is that this thing right here was set to be alpha. So this is a size alpha test. Now, I've said this is also alpha. Your book is a little bit different here. But just see what happens right here. This is alpha. That's alpha. So tracking the two things, this thing is zero. So if that thing is zero right here, then we know that beta one, beta, beta one star, just write it all down. The difference between these two things is positive. So if that's zero, 
this is positive. So that's what we just concluded. So, delta, this test right here, conforming to that power function, it's always bigger than this thing right here, because I've used this rule. And so what it means is this is uniformly most powerful. It didn't matter which theta ones I plugged in there. So this would have been true for whatever value of theta one I had plugged in there. And so that's the uniform concept. And so we've just proved this, the first part. Let me say a little bit more about this. If I had said that this test right here was level alpha, what we actually mean is that the maximum, the book likes to write down supremum, supremum theta in H naught of beta, our power function is less than or equal to alpha. So they allow you in the book to consider this other test, we'll say for this other test that it's level alpha right here. So they'll say, if you try to decrease your Air rate in the type 1 space in this other test, this test will still have more power. That should be obvious from all the pictures we've drawn of power curves, that if I decrease my type 1 air, I will increase my type 2 air. That's what this statement is about in the book. So if they end up saying that this is less than or equal to alpha, right here, then what they're saying is that this difference That's less than or equal to alpha. This thing is going to be positive. So right in here, this thing's positive because this is going to be bounded by alpha. So this whole term is negative. So this thing is negative right here. And so what we find is that this is still true. get rid of that, subtract it off, and this whole equation is going to be bounded by this term right here. So this inequality is still true when this test has a smaller type 1 error rate than alpha. If you've ever done any testing and you understand the balance between type 1 and type 2 errors, this would have been obvious to you. But here's the formal proof of that. This thing's positive. So this whole equation right here is bounded by this thing right here, which is still positive. Okay. So check mark. This thing is uniformly most powerful. So then Naaman and Pearson go on to proof, and this is the only thing out there. They, they actually prove something just slightly different than that. But for all intents and purposes, it's true. So let's look at that. Same equation. So we're going to be trying to convince ourselves that this is the only uniformly most powerful test. So we start from the same equation right here. This is bounded by zero. And what we're going to assume is that well, we already know this is uniformly most powerful. We just showed it. We're going to assume that this right here, this other test, if we want to prove 
that there's some other uniformly most powerful test out there, but that test really is this test, we'll say this thing is also uniformly most powerful. So let's just write down, this is UMP for part B. So whatever rules that I'm wiggling around right there, I've made this thing uniformly most powerful. So this is UMP. What we'll show in a second is that these two tests have to be the same. And so this is UMP, and this is UMP right here. And so what it means is that the power function is the same. These two things are equal to each other. So if they're both uniformly most powerful, they both have high probabilities of rejecting the null hypothesis when you're in the alternative space. So this is the alternative. They're both UMP, uniformly most powerful. Whatever that max probability is, it's the same between both of them. And so that's what we're assuming here. So the difference between these two things is zero. So we just did this the other way around last time. We argued that those were zero. That was zero. Or at least it was positive. Because we're assuming these are both uniformly most powerful, they're equal to each other. Have the same probability of rejecting the null in the alternative space. And so this part is zero. And then I have this part to consider. If I say that both tests are size alpha, that's an alpha minus an alpha right there. So the caveat here is I just have one data point that I'm looking at. And so this is the easiest maximization in the world. So what they argue in the proof is that both of these are alpha because I'm doing the simple versus simple thing. And so this whole thing is zero. So both tests are UMP. Both have the same probability of making a type 1 error because the maximum over this whole space is just that data point. So that's why I usually say just let this thing be alpha in the first place. We're only dealing with one data point. The other part's interesting, but we already knew it for a level alpha test. So they're both the same power and they have the same type 1 error rate. So that means that this equation is identically zero. Let's back up and look at this. So what that means is that this integral is zero. That's how we derive these power functions. And so instead of just being an inequality and being an equality, in this case, because I've assumed that thing's UMP, what it means since I'm integrating over this positive function right here, and it's zero across the whole space, it means that these things have to be equal to each other. So if I'm going to integrate over this thing right here, and it's zero, regardless of anything else, because I've assumed this is UMP, then it means that function right there is zero. So this thing is equal to zero the difference between those. So that means delta x is equal to delta star x. So they're the same. <coughs> okay. Now somebody usually does this to me right here and they say, well, there's, there could be a little disagreement between these two tests right here. I'm integrating over them. I could have them disagree at like a point or something like that. But when I integrate over that, that very small difference 
for like a point, no intervals. They can't differ on an interval, but they can maybe differ at a point. Um, and this statement would still be true. So they're the same on any measurable set, I should say. Meaning that if I integrate over this right here, this thing has to integrate to zero, the difference between those two things. They can't be different on an interval. So almost true that they're exactly the same, but if you construct a test, and you just change what happens at a particular point in x, and x was a continuum, no big deal. So you're allowed to do that. Um, the interpretation is, is it never really happens anyway, or it happens so infrequently compared to the infinite, uncountably infinite number of things that it doesn't have any weight. So this is just a technical point. So that's the name of Pearson law. So you fix the type 1 error rate, and they give you a device for figuring out a test statistic such that that test statistic, if you use it, um, and figure out what your rejection region is such that your type 1 error rate is fixed, maybe at 0 0.05, we'll call that alpha. But if you base that test statistic off of the likelihood ratio test, you're going to be uniformly most powerful. So it's telling you the correct statistic to look at. Okay, couple caveats in all of this. F is known. And so in practice, a lot of times, we don't have F and we're modeling F. And so we want to think about how that's going to impact all of this. I'll make some statements about it next time. Um, I guess what you could ask when you do that, if I change F, what is my actual type 1 error rate? And so I like to have people simulate that and kind of see how if you, know, you actually made a mistake in defining F, how their type 1 errors are actually adjusted to that. I think it's something you should always check. So we'll come back next time. We'll spend a lot of time talking about the point null test because I think that's where there's a lot of interest and debate. And I want it to at least become a little bit clear to you why we disagree with each other. So with that in mind, enjoy the weekend, and I'll see you next time. Take care.